Ivermectin is something that has increasingly appeared in the public consciousness in the war against COVID-19. So let's just go back a bit to see where we started from. It started out as being reported as an unusual pneumonia in Wuhan in China, and has one of the first papers that reported. Then it was a viral pneumonia, very quickly became more widely considered a respiratory disease with unusual symptoms. And then it expanded to vascular disease with coagulation issues, cardiac complications. And not too long after, it became considered a whole body disease, potentially attacking all vital organs. And its variations from anything from no effects at all to very severe illness, and from being over fairly quickly to lingering for months in the form of long COVID. As the disease has spread in many parts of the world increasingly out of control, there's been increasing desperation. Vaccines were developed in record time. At one point, over 200 projects were counted. And it's the first mass deployment of some amazing new technologies, including messenger RNA vaccines. But there's also a readiness out there to believe in miracle cures. The first one of these that got a lot of attention was hydroxychloroquine. It's a malaria therapy. It's very widely used and generally pretty safe. Early studies showed promise but were of poor quality. There's massive political and social media pressure. The US Food and Drug Administration uh, approved emergency use authorization on the 28th of March and revoked it on the 15th of June as studies showed that on average it was more likely to cause harm than good. So is this predictable? Well, while side effects were rare, they overlapped with complications of COVID, particularly cardiac ones like arrhythmia. And so although those were rare complications in broader use, if you had comorbidities that had a big overlap with them, it's not too surprising that on average it does worse than not using it. Although there may possibly be scenarios where it is a reasonable therapy to use, but with the massive public pressure, it was very hard for regulators to resist, but that does not trump evidence. So on now to Ivermectin, the group styling itself the frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance has been pushing it hard. They have a paper that's soon to appear in Frontiers in Pharmacology, and it's out in preprint that's not likely to be too much different from the final version. So I'm going to look at that briefly. But first, what is ivermectin? It's a very widely used anti-parasitic drug. Three billion doses have already been used. It's inexpensive, it's safe. And the main side effects the FDA reports are interactions with particular parasites. There aren't, for instance, particular cardiac issues as there were with hydroxychloroquine. So why would it apply for COVID-19? Well, an in vitro study, that's a lab study, showed significant antiviral efficacy, but you would need 60 times the usual dose or 10 times the highest dose that's been tested for safety to get the same level of ivermectin as was used in the lab study. So going from in vitro, which in Latin means in glass, to in vivo, which means in a living organism, to misquote the old proverb, there's many a slip twixt petri and pill. A tiny fraction of drug research leads to usable product. Even that which gets to a product that get, goes into testing, it may be as little as 4 or 5% that actually goes into final production. So why? So in a petri dish, you've got a very artificial environment. You may have cells there, but they're not in a living organism. You can precisely control the drug concentration, there are no other complex processes to interfere. In an actual body with living cells, the level of absorption of the medication depends on the tissue type. It, you might get more of it in lung and less in liver, for example, and sometimes that's what you want and sometimes it's not what you want. And there are other complex factors, including the immune response, inflammatory response, and so on. So just showing something in a pure lab-based study is a very, very, very early stage of showing efficacy with a real drug in a real body. So 
should we be skeptical? Well, we've got a complex, multifaceted viral disorder, and some people are saying a worm pill fixes it. So what's to disbelieve? Well, this is science. The evidence is what matters. It doesn't matter what we prefer to believe one way or the other. We need to look at the evidence. Let's see what the evidence is. Well, I'm going to focus on just the one paper by Corey et al. because it's the one that's been getting all the attention. As I said before, it's almost published. This is the abstract of the published version. If you can zoom in a bit closer to see a bit more detail. The version I've actually read is a preprint, which is probably very close to the published version. The thing I really want to focus on here is where the abstract ends. It says, FLCCC argues it's imperative that major national international health care agencies devote necessary resources to more quickly validate these studies and confirm major positive epidemiological impacts that have been recorded in ivermectin is widely distributed and so on. So what they're arguing for is that regulatory bodies should investigate this thing with some urgency. They're not saying instantly use it on a large scale, at least not in this paper. So let's look at some of the evidence. I've just looked at a few, by no means a large part of what they looked at in their paper. Prophylactic studies, studies that look at preventing disease rather than treating people once they're ill. Charlotte's paper had 117 in each arm and if you have a study like this where you have one group that's treated and the other group that's a control, you need to say what the control treatment was so you know what you're comparing with and they don't. Truman, you report a clinical trial. Clinicaltrials.gov is a site that reports these and there are many of them that have not yet re reached the research literature. What they report there does not actually reflect the results in the Corey et al. paper. Algazar has a comparison with hydroxychloroquine, which is a flawed basis for comparison because we know an average hydroxychloroquine is worse than not treating at all. Carvello looks at a combination of carrageenan and ivermectin, so not just looking at the effect of one drug on its own. If you look at clinical trials, this is where you're looking at people already ill. This again is a very small sample. Mahmoud looks at a combination of ivermectin and doxycycline and claims that the control in one part of the description is placebo and somewhere else standard of care, which is not the same thing. So we don't really know what they're comparing with what. Chaudhuri also looks at a combination of ivermectin and doxycycline and their comparison is with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So all these studies are comparing different things with different things. Morganston's study has no control. They just look at reduced mortality compared with internationally reported results. So again, not a very strong study. So a lot more than this is reported in the paper. My cause for concern here is just the first year I picked out the serious flaws and it could be they have other higher quality trials included, but because they've included low quality trials, it reduces my confidence in the quality of the overall paper. Every one of the examples I picked out had serious issues. So another facet of the paper is epidemiology, looking at populations where ivermectin had been used versus where it hadn't. And a particular example, one of several they looked at was in Peru. And the case they made was that in Lima, ivermectin had not been widely used, whereas the other regions they study it had been. And Lima is the red part of the chart. The varying shades of blue are the regions where ivermectin was widely deployed. And the leftmost panel shows total deaths. And by this, they calculated deaths based on excess deaths, which is a statistic which says how many more people died than would have been the case in the average year. The middle panel is case fatalities for COVID-19. The standard definition for case fatality is somebody who has tested positive in a lab for the 
for the virus. And the final one is case incidence, which again is from positive tests in the lab. So if we look at these three panels, what you see is looking at the rightmost one, Lima has a much bigger secondary surge in the number of cases. It also has a higher number of fatalities by both measures on an ongoing basis than the other regions. So what about their claim then that the Lima difference is explained by no ivermectin in Lima? Well, we have to be a little careful interpreting a thing like this. There are four factors in how fast a disease spreads. How contagious it is, how long an individual is contagious, societal mixing, and how many are susceptible. And we know that the last two can change quite fast. Mixing, for instance, is the target of measures like masking, lockdowns, distancing, and so on. The number susceptible also declines as more and more people get infected and recover because we know the fraction who get the disease twice is quite low. So you need to be sure you're comparing like with like. Now Lima is a big city. The level of societal mixing there is likely to be a lot different from the other comparison regions which are relatively rural. So you have to be really careful interpreting that sort of evidence. So in summary then, too much of the evidence is questionable. And going too hard, too fast, risks unintended consequences. Mass deployment could lead to mass disappointment if it turns out not to work as well as was claimed. And also pushing something too fast against the regulatory mechanism undermines confidence in the drug regulatory system. So where should we go next with this? Well, Andrew Hill's group is making a more serious effort at winnowing down to better studies. Where they're at now is that the evidence is not strong enough for mass deployment, but they do create a good case to push for better trials and working out how to secure supply if the results are positive. 